Welcome to another edition of Porch Center, everyone. I am Brian Sipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am pretty good, Brian. It's good to see you uh, early in January. I think we've got time to talk about the Kentucky Derby and maybe our second edition of the top 10, 12, 16 horses. Let's do it, Matt. We're going to we're gonna unveil our new Kentucky Derby rankings here, fresh off the presses. Uh, we, uh, as often happens, we agree on a lot, Matt, but uh, there is uh, plenty of uh, a disagreement out there as well. So without further ado, there's our cover boy this week, Forte. And uh, let's see how prominently the uh, two-year-old champion-to-be Breeders' Cup juvenile winner is uh, in our rankings. But first, we're going to go from the bottom up, Matt, if you will. So it's going to be 9 through 12. You'll see both of us together. Oh, I got listed first. Matt should be listed first. But anyway, let's start at the bottom, Matt. Number 12, I'll let you go first. I see you have a horse at 12 that I don't have on my list at all. Yeah, uh, you know, my horse is uh, in in the bottom four spots are, are you know, uh, mostly first time or early maiden winners waiting to do, uh, uh, waiting for their next race. And Disarm is one of them for me. Disarm uh, is a Steve Asmussen horse that um, I really liked at Saratoga. Um, uh, didn't win his first start, but then was extremely impressive in his second start. A son of Gun Runner from the connections of Gun Runner, that's Asmussen and Winchell Thoroughbreds, um, waiting to get back in training. Um, but I was impressed early on. Yeah, Matt, I, I can't disagree with you. Actually, one of my favorite horses, uh, juveniles at Saratoga was Disarm. He beat a horse pretty easily that I liked, Arthur's Ride, who is still a maiden at this point, but I, I'm still looking for big things from Arthur's Ride. Disarm beat him easily, and he had that uh, decent maiden where he got beat at Churchill Downs uh, before he went to Saratoga and was very impressive. My number 12 is Corona Bolt, and, uh, of course, Bolt Doro made a lot of noise a few years back as a two-year-old especially kind of disappointed uh, at three a little bit but uh, a son of Medagliadoro who is very talented he's coming around as a good young sire it looks like and Corona Bolt it, it, I, I struggled to add him to the list as you can see he's 12 of 12 for me Matt but um, he's only had two sprints he's won at Churchill Downs already that sugar bowl six furlong stakes at fairgrounds in New Orleans was a little bit too good to deny. I had to include Corona Bolt because he's not bred to be a sprinter, even though he's only gone six furlongs so far. Yeah, Brian. And, you know, uh, I've got Corona Bolt on my list and you folks, we'll see where I have him uh, shortly um, from the barn of Brad Cox. And I'll tell you, Brian, right now, it looks like Brad Cox has the strongest hand um, amongst the Kentucky Derby winners, so many horses and already uh, two or three that have won Derby prep races. Um, Brad Cox is loaded. Brad Cox is loaded, Matt. Um, I, I might disagree with you as, as some others I'm sure would because there's the name, there's always the name Bob Baffert out there. Although on the other hand, maybe Bob Baffert is not loaded because He's still suspended from uh, from participating in the Kentucky Derby, so we'll have to see about that. But I, I do agree with you. Brad Cox has a lot more so than ever interesting two-year-olds on his list. But uh, we're not going to Brad Cox with the next pick, Matt. Number 11 for you is who? Extra Anejo, uh, Brian. Um, another impressive Steve Asmussen debut winner. Um, this one happened at Keeneland a little bit, a little bit more recently in October. Um, little concerned he had one workout um, after the maiden win in November and hasn't had another one since then. Uh, probably just Asmussen giving him some time, hopefully. 
Yeah, actually, uh, Extra Anejo was high on my list after that main performance at Keeneland that I saw. I thought it was very impressive as well, and he's bred to, to get uh, classic distances. I was concerned, and the reason he fell off my list was because they said he would be missing some time. Um, it, it looks like, though, the good news is Extra Anejo is uh, near ready for a return, and, and if you're uh, missing some time but uh, returning now in January, early February, that uh, that makes life very doable still for making the Kentucky Derby. So extra Anejos, Anejo is a horse I like. Didn't include him because of the shelving for a while, but uh, signs are good that he'll be back sometime soon. Number 11 on my list, Matt, is Blazing Sevens. I feel like I'm holding on to Blazing Sevens a little bit. Uh, another young sire that I've been impressed with so far is Good Magic and Blazing Sevens on occasion has looked really good. It's kind of been on again, off again for Blazing Sevens. But having said that, I can't fault his losses too much, which include last time a fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. He wasn't beaten all that badly in a big field, and he had some trouble at the start. I think Blazing Sevens for uh, for Chad Brown still has a place uh, as, a, as a true Kentucky Derby contender. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian, and I have Blazing Sevens on my list a, a good bit higher than you do um, uh, based on that, his win of the Champagne Stakes. Yeah, the Champagne was on and off track, so I'm not sure what that means yet, and I've seen some good Magics run on off track, but he hasn't exactly um, uh, uh, been bad on a, on a fast track either, so... Blazing Sevens, uh, an interesting horse that should not be forgotten despite being out of the money in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Number 10, Matt, on the list. Ooh, I see you have a horse that I like. Signatory. He's only a maiden winner, though. Yeah, yeah, and I have him. Uh, I think you have him on your list also, Brian. Uh, Shug McGahey, I think we've talked about Signature on a couple of – Signature on a couple of shows already. Uh, broke his maiden at Aqueduct, um, and he's back in training. He's got one-time workout at uh, Payson Park for Shug already, a son of Tappet. Yeah, he's a well-bred son of Tappet. He looks good. I liked what I saw in both of those two starts he made in New York last year. Uh, of course, he got beaten the first one, but then he came back with a nice win. West Point is part of the ownership, and they've been keeping uh, uh, us abreast of Signature, just like Extra Anejo, a brief shelving. Uh, we thought he might see him in the uh, Remsen late last fall, uh, but he did need to miss a little time. But like you said, Matt, the, the son of Tappet in the Shook McGahey barn is back, and uh, he will be ready to run probably in the next month or two. So Signature, definitely one I like as well. Victory Formation, uh, I had a hard time deciding where I was going to put him. I knew I wanted to put this undefeated son uh, of Taprit. I couldn't think of the name for a second. A Belmont Stakes winner. Maybe not one of the best Belmont Stakes winners of recent, of recent years, but Taprit was a Belmont Stakes winner, so there's some distance there for victory formation. He's also undefeated in three starts at three different tracks. He looks like he's getting better with every start. There's a lot to like there for victory formation. Yeah, Brian, another one from the Brad Cox barn, um, you know, going into the Smarty Jones, which he won for his third start. He, I had a little bit of concern because his first two races were uh, in sprints, but uh, he stretched out really nicely to take the Smarty Jones. Um, I think Brad Cox has said that the Rebel Stakes at Oakland Park might be next for victory formation and it makes me think a little bit about corona bolt that we mentioned already brian who has sprinted in his first two starts yeah victory formation doesn't um maybe i'm a little bit more worried about corona bolt coming back in at six furlong stakes race that's what's got me thinking corona bolt i'm not sure whether he's going to be a two-turn horse but both of these horses have the pedigree to go two turns. So uh, victory formation has looked very good. And obviously that Smarty Jones was an impressive win. Next on the list, Matt, we're going to go up to number nine, the last horse on this first third of our top 12s. And I tell you what, Silver Heist, you came up with a horse that's not really yet on my radar. 
Silver Heist, another one for Steve Asmussen, uh, a maiden winner for Whisper Hill Farms, not quite as flashy a name on the dam side as so many of those Mandy Pope Whisper Hill horses are, but uh, this Asmussen runner broke his maiden at fairgrounds on December 20, 26th, rallied nicely after a pretty slow break going six furlongs. He's got two works back already at fairgrounds. Yeah, Silver Heights looks like a horse who could very well move forward. You made me look at him again because, he, as you said, that maiden win probably wasn't very flashy. But that's okay for a horse that, that they want to see if he can be a classic horse. He's got the breeding. He's in a good barn, obviously. So Silver Heist is a horse who very well, I think you could be right, could be moving forward soon. My number nine, you, you know, it, it's it's strange that a horse coming off a loss at Remington Park would make my top 12, Matt. But I think we both like Giant Mischief. I, I liked him before he even won that nice allowance race at Keeneland. And then I think at Remington Park, uh, the son of Into Mischief, trained by Brad Cox, uh, did not have the best of trips. And I really like the way he finished down there in the springboard mile. I think Giant Mischief will make more noise on this Kentucky Derby Trail. Yeah, I, and uh, talking about that second in the springboard mile with with the poor start, lunging out of the gate and, and other trouble, I think he was the best horse in that uh, springboard mile. Yeah, the best horse in the springboard mile, that doesn't necessarily still bode well for a Kentucky Derby run, but I think there's more to Giant Mischief than uh, than we've seen quite yet. I like Again, I like that allowance win uh, at Keeneland over a very highly regarded Bob Baffert. All right, Matt, that's 9 through 12. We're counting down towards our number one. So you want to just skip it and go right to a number one now? <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll take that lap as a no. We're going to... We're going to go through five through eight. Oh, there it is. Number five through eight. Again, we're going backwards, counting down. Matt, you have a horse I want to really like as your number eight. Yeah, I think we both have Brad Cox horses as our number eights. Uh, um, I have Jace's Road, uh, Brad Cox, another one of his winners on the Kentucky Derby Trail already when he picked up uh, 10 more points for his victory in the gun runner at fairgrounds, which he did on the front end by five lengths. Yeah, the gunner, the gun runner makes me want to like Jason's road more, but I worry about those stakes losses at Churchill down. There's something there that I just worry that he is not going to, um, He's not going to have the answers uh, when the big questions are asked in the stretch, but we'll see. The gun runner certainly was a very good rebound race for the Sun of Quality. And, and of course, I have my eye on, even though he's not on my list. My number eight is Instant Coffee Madden. By scanning our five through eights here, I can see we both have Instant Coffee prominently on our lists. And uh, there's that young Cyric and Bolt Doro. Uh, instant coffee, as you said, Brad Cox. Uh, I like what I've seen from instant coffee. Getting back to that silly maiden that I like, like Arthur's Ride, instant coffee beat him at Saratoga in a very nice maiden race uh, before uh, running uh, uh, probably a sneaky good fourth in what's become a key race at uh, Breeders Futurity, grade one Breeders Futurity at Keeneland. And then, yeah, the, 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 uh, the race at Churchill Downs last time, the grade two uh, race to Churchill Downs last time was slow. And th that made me think maybe instant coffee is just, just not going to be quite good enough to be a, a top tip type of derby horse. But on the other hand, I like the way he won it. He can move forward. He's a great stakes winner already at Churchill. That's my number eight. Yeah, I agree with everything that you said. And just to add in, he's been working a lot since uh, his victory in the Kentucky Jockey Club. He's got four works um, at fairgrounds. Yeah, he's down in New Orleans, so I think we'll see instant coffee soon and probably ready to make some noise down there. Matt, is there anything you want to add to your number seven pick, who we've already talked about a little bit? That's Corona Bolt, a two-time sprint winner in two career starts. No, I don't think I have anything else to add. All right, Corona Bolt, a very impressive six for long sugar ball winner. My number seven, Matt, and I guess we should, talk about Bob Baffert now a little bit because we have 
have it yet. I, I think there's, you know, just a plethora of horses that are in the Bafford barn, big, big purchases, lots of talent. We've seen uh, lots of stakes races in California, won by these two-year-olds, now three-year-olds. Faustin is not one of them because he's only made one career race. I decided to put Bob Bauer horses in there because I think just like last year, they'll eventually make the Kentucky Derby probably for another trainer. You decided not to, and that's okay. Faustin is a horse I think has world, a world of potential, really, really well bred. Curlin out of a grade one winning uh, hard spun mare. He looked good, maybe not super flashy, but he just looked like a classic type of horse to me when he won his maiden at Santa Anita. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I didn't put the Bob Baffert horses on my list because right now they are ineligible for the Kentucky Derby. And, yeah, certainly some of them or all of them are going to end up with other trainers. I'm not sure when that's going to happen, uh, when in, when it does. And if they're worthy, I will uh, add them in at that point. But, you know, honestly, you know, the, some of the Baffert uh, – maiden winners uh, that have come back in uh, the sham and the low South futurity um, have been a little bit, a little bit disappointing. Like for instance, national treasure uh, um, and one of Baffert's longest shots winning the sham, I guess, as we sit and wait to see when cave rock is going to return. Yeah. There, there, there's uh, there's a lot of Baffert's, that would be on the list. So it'll be interesting. There's two, three possibilities here. None of these horses is running the Kentucky Derby. I think that's the least likely. Another unlikely thing is Bob Baffert somehow legally gets back into the Kentucky Derby. I don't, I don't think that's very likely. But what we saw last year, I think, is the most, most likely thing. And that was a guy like Tim team picked these horses up in time to get some uh, uh, prep uh, points. And then they ran in the Kentucky Derby. Although last year, the the Baffert slash Yachtin horses didn't do a whole lot in that Kentucky Derby. All right, we move on, Matt. Um, these are two horses that we've already talked about in, in Signature and Giant Mischief. Uh, um, both of them numbers on the list. You like Giant Mischief even more than I do. Yeah, I really do because uh, it wasn't only uh, the way he performed uh, in the Springboard Mile. It was races leading up to that and ra and horses that he beat in those races that for me is just as much or if not more of the reason that i like giant mischief yeah he's running some interesting tracks too there was the win at caneland which again i liked quite a bit but uh, horseshoe indianapolis and then remington park he, he seems a horse that can take his race to different places and I think he will be definitely a horse that makes some noise on the Kentucky Derby Trail. Signature is, has a long way to go. He's only running two maiden races in New York, for sure. But again, I just really liked what I see. I, I like that pedigree. I, I'm still probably too much of a pedigree guy for the Kentucky Derby handicapping that we do, but I can't help it. Signature just, just looks like a classic horse to me. That's why I have him so high at number six. Matt, number five for you. Instant coffee, the son of old Dora. Yeah, and we talked about him on your list also. I think um, I, I gave a little bit more preference for horses that have wins and have performed on the Derby Trail already. And uh, uh, that's why I have uh, instant coffee a little higher than you probably. Yeah, and my number four, I, I, I've seen people still talking about Arabian night. We only saw a maiden race at Keeneland so far. Baffert, this, this is the one Baffert's been talking about more than any of his, his well-bred, talented three-year-olds. And we'll have to wait and see. But that maiden race sure looked good. A son of Uncle Mo, it was back on Breeders' Cup weekend. I guess he was a $2.3 million purchase. Uh, Arabian night, it just seems like a a horse who could be really, really good. I didn't want to put him above number five with only a maiden sprint to his uh, to his, his uh, resume. But uh, on the other hand, I, I could not deny how good he looked in that race at camp. Anything to add on Arabian Night, Matt? No, Brian. Uh, um, I, I it was a, he's a Baffert, and I'm going to wait and see. 
you're quiet on the back roots. Arabian Night, though, a horse of uh, uh, big potential in my eyes. Number four through one. Oh, there it is. We're giving for people listening. They don't know yet. For people watching, they now know who our number ones are. But before we get to that, we're going to talk number four, Matt. And, and uh, yeah, that, that's a horse we've talked about a little bit. Victory Formation is your number four. I, I could have easily had him higher on my list. Yeah, Brad Cox, uh, uh, perfect record, a uh, lot of potential there. So uh, got him a higher ranking for me. Yeah, it's interesting to me as well a little bit that Brad Cox is running these horses at different racetracks, and, and Victory Formation is another example of that. And, and, and I think that's a, a good thing to have, a good foundation to have as you enter these tough uh, Kentucky Derby Trail races, then, of course, the Classics themselves victory formation impressive so far and for me number four I, again another horse i probably could have put higher cave rock um, we both said it not cave rock did not look good in the minutes or, or, or the several minutes before entering the starting gate of the breeders cup he was a heavy favorite in the breeders cup juvenile and uh the son of barricade was a heavy favorite because he looked so good in winning in his first three races out in southern california uh, Eric, a, you think he will get a distance? He was passed by one horse in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, but probably a pretty game performance, especially for a horse who didn't look good in in, in the post parade uh, coming up to that race. So, Cave Rock, uh, I still think will take some beating on this Kentucky Derby Trail. It's my number four. And we're going to jump to number three, Matt, and we have very different horses here at number number three, although both of them have one. One thing in common, and that's that they've only so far won a maiden race. Yeah, um, I have uh, logins um, at my number three. You, as you folks can see, you have logins at number two on yours. Another one of those Brad Coxes was second to Forte in the Breeders' Futurity by a neck, and we know what Forte went on to do uh, after the Breeders' Futurity. Um, Logan set the pace in that race and got caught by Forte. Um, a lot to be impressed with by from this horse. Um, doesn't have any works back since then. Um, I don't know if there's a reason to be concerned or not, or maybe it's there's a reason to be confident that Brad Cox is waiting on this one a little bit longer and is going to uh, bring him back in the bigger races, the 50-pointers or 100-point race uh, later in the year. Yeah, I think that's what's going to happen by default. Again, another horse who just, uh, it seemed like he needed a little time for, for something undisclosed, minor. But uh, yeah, he, he was supposed to be back working again in New Orleans by now, but it's, uh, it's just taken a little while. I don't think it's anything serious, and I do expect him back soon. But Loggins, uh, a very impressive horse in his two starts, a son and Ghost Zapper. So impressive, in fact, that I, I have him number two on my list. Uh, Loggins, uh, you know, if you're talking key races as a two-year-old, you, you, we've got to talk about the Breeders' Futurity again, that great one race at Caneland, because we had a, a few horses from that on the list. But, of course, the top two, uh, Forte and Loggins, look so good. And, and all the talk uh, after the Breeders' Futurity was Log Loggins was probably the best horse in the race. Uh, Forte was horse with much more experience going in. Loggins off a big maiden debut win uh, at Churchill Downs, came to Keeneland and ran his eyeballs out and, and just got edged late in a, in a pretty rough stretch drive with Forte. So I like Loggins a lot. He's definitely my favorite of the, uh, uh, of the Brad Cox horses. Uh, my number three is also a son of Ghost Zapper. Both of our threes are Ghost Zappers. And uh, mine is Banishing, and Banishing is a horse that didn't make your list at all, but I am pre pretty high on Banishing. Uh, Brendan Walsh, one of the most underrated trainers in the country, has this horse for Gold Offit. Physically, he's uh, pretty attractive, a big chestnut with a big stride. A son of Ghost Zapper, who's got uh, distance breeding on both sides as a grand on uh, Broodmare Sires. AP Indy, so I like him moving forward. Um, yeah, a little bit of trouble in his maiden, and uh, and, and he was beaten a few lengths there, but he came right back for his second start and won going away at Churchill. Uh, I'm sorry, Fairgrounds by more than 
eight lengths. Of note, Matt, Matt it, was, uh, it was just ever so slightly, the same distance, the same day, the same track, slightly faster than the gun runner. And that was, uh, in co of course, won impressively by uh, a horse on your list in Jace's Road. So a lot to like for me for banishing. Yeah, and folks, if you didn't uh, see it already, uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, Brian did a feature article in his column about the prospects of banishing. Yeah, banishing is one I like. I already talked about logins in depth as my number two, and we mentioned your number two already, Matt, but let's talk a little bit more about Blazing Sevens. I think some people, and, and, and even me, I was surprised a little bit that you had Blazing Sevens quite so high. Well, I was, uh, you know, it's Chad Brown. Um, he's had some uh, impressive races already. Um, the Champagne win, I think his performance in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile was uh, pretty good also. I just have a feeling that uh, there's plenty of reason that this one could move forward. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Blazing Sevens is a horse, like I said, he was low, much lower on my list, but still made my list. And a horse, I think, can uh, bounce back off of that fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile for sure. All right, Matt, we're at that point where we're going to reveal each of our number ones here. It's the same horse. And, and I think it's the horse that's deserving to be number one. And that horse, Matt, is who? It's Forte uh, for uh, Todd Pletcher, who had a fantastic year in uh, 2022. And I guess is likely to be named the top trainer in the Eclipse Awards coming up from what I've seen in uh, uh, people's, uh, people's ballots. Um, it's been a number of years since Todd has uh, gotten that Eclipse Award, but, you know, uh, Forte's performance on the track with three grade one victories, over 1.5 million in earnings already, uh, uh, really gives him a resume that stands above the rest of the horses that we have mentioned. Um, no works back, but again, I assume that uh, um, Pletcher's waiting a little bit and we'll probably see him in uh, maybe the Fountain of Youth uh, next at Gulfstream Park. Yeah, look for Forte to show up in South Florida uh, in a not too distant future, but uh, the, the the break was planned for this one because he had a pretty complete two-year-old season. Of course, he's a three-time grade one winner. Uh, Violence is another younger sire, not as young as some of the sires we talked about. Then Violence was a horse who probably never got the chance to show how good he was, a really, really nice two-year-old. And now he's got Forte, and Forte is one of those who is a blame broodmare. And there's a couple horses on this list that I like a lot that are blame broodmares. I, I think that means distance for me. Uh, so Forte, uh, very talented young sire out of a blame broodmare, three grade one wins. Uh, he only had one loss. He won impressively at three different tracks. But more than anything, he came to Keeneland for two big grade one races, two two-turn races. And he proved to be the best two-year-old in the country in that Breeders' Futurity. And then even more impressively over Cave Rock and the rest in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Forte, um, you know, the horses who have won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Horses who have been named the two-year-old champion, often that's the same horse, uh, don't have a great record in the Kentucky Derby. So we'll have to wait and see. But uh, with so many good horses, that's kind of natural. Although back in our uh, day, Matt, we saw a lot more two-year-old champions come back and do it again at three. But it'll be interesting because Forte sure looked good and deserving of all the accolades and clearly deserving of our number one spot here so far. Uh, January where you know we still got a ways to go on this Kentucky Derby Trail, but Forte, number one on the list for now. I think he did a really good job with this list, Matt. Well done. On that note, let me get a parting shot from you, my friend. Yeah, I don't know, Brian. It still feels early, and it and there aren't really any horses on your list or my list that I'm uh, totally smitten with. But I would imagine we've got a few in here that are going to make it to the Kentucky Derby field. Um, so stay with us uh, on Horse Center as we talk about races of the week and Kentucky Derby stuff. And as always, thanks for watching the show.
Yeah, yeah, Matt. You know what? I, I think there's about, well, let's see. We, we had our top 12s and we had four differences on each. So that gives me a total of 16 horses. I think 16 of these horses will make the Kentucky Derby in a few months on the first Saturday. And <laughs> no, the odds of that happening are a bazillion to one, folks. But no, I, th I think there'll be a bunch of these horses that do make the starting gate for the Kentucky Derby. We'll see what happens, though, in the coming months. But for now, this is our list. This is our rankings for the Kentucky Derby. As always, we appreciate you watching the show, folks. Thanks for tuning in. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, go ahead and do that now for us. Thanks to our sponsor, the best contest site out there. That's Derby Wars. And, folks, we'll be back next week talking racing as we move through these winter months and get ever closer to the first Saturday of May. We'll see you then.